Well, let's introduce uh, the first international speaker of today. Please welcome on stage Robert Stevens. Woo! <laughs> Hello, Robert. This is for you, and uh, we just wanted to say, please come, that um, we were very happy to have a, a sort of uh, a similar uh, concept about uh, how imagination can be a powerful tool to shape cities. Yep. I'm also eager to say that we met virtually because of our love to, uh, for Patrick Geddes, which is one of our heroes, uh, but we never met in person except for a few minutes ago. Yeah. The stage, the stage is, is yours. yours. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Luca. Uh, thank you so much to the, the whole Torino Stratosferica team. I must say this is the most beautiful venue I've ever spoken at. Uh, so I'm really, really honored, delighted to be here. Um, I will also say it's the first time I'm speaking with a, a device like this. So I'm a little nervous, so bear with me. Um, yeah. <coughs> oh, are we connected? How do we... Yeah, it's moving, I can see, but it, yeah, okay, there we go. So three things about me as we get started. The first, I'm an introvert. Uh, this is something I, I discovered during the pandemic that I really thrived in isolation and quietude. Uh, I like white space, which you see. Um, and that's an ironic kind of discovery because for the last 15 years, I've lived here in Mumbai, uh, a city of 20 plus million. Um, <clears throat> Uh, according to USA Today, it's the most dense city in the world, about 30,000 people per square kilometer. Uh, by comparison, New Delhi and New York City, about 11 and 10,000 people uh, per square kilometer. So we have a lot of crowd, uh, and that's been home uh, uh, for the last 15 years. Um, the second thing about me, I love humor. I love jokes. Uh, so if you hear something this morning that you think maybe it's supposed to be a joke, it probably is. Uh, feel free to laugh. Let it pass if you don't find it humorous. The choice is yours. Um, and the third thing, again, another pandemic hobby I picked up, I realized under the right circumstances, I love to do the dishes at night, to wash our dishes. Um, and that's really, really critical and interesting because Agatha Christie said, the best time to plan a book is while you're doing the dishes. Um, it's also a great introvert activity because nobody will bother you while you're washing dishes. Yeah? This is what came out of, uh, out of that, that time doing the dishes, Bombay Imagined. Uh, it's 200 urban visions, imaginations, plans, dreams for the city, beginning in 1670, continuing through to 2020, all of them unrealized. So everything you see this morning will be unrealized. And the book, the idea began here uh, in 1869, the professional papers on Indian engineering. For anyone who loves drainage, uh, sanitation, I like, I really love reading about drainage. This is the book for you. Um, I was just browsing this one day and I came upon this fabulous fold-out map, a big beautiful fold-out with a green blob in the center. And I was really intrigued, what is this green blob? I zoomed in. Uh, and it was a proposed park in 1869, uh, in the smack dab in the middle of Bombay. Very beautiful. Uh, it turned out to be a 400-acre idea. Uh, it was actually on top of the city's first landfill, so it had a lot of uh, symbolism behind it. And this was, it was planned by Arthur Crawford. He described it as a people's park such as London does not possess. That was the vision. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so this was the dream. I started researching Arthur Crawford. He was, of course, a municipal commissioner, a politician. And he had, uh, this is the gentleman himself, um, and he had a lot of ideas. He actually self-published them in this book, The Development of New Bombay, self-published in 1908. And he talked about all kinds of ideas, the length and breadth of the city. So this really inspired, started the search. What else was there in the city's urban past that was dreamt of but never realized? I started researching, found a lot of material from sanitation, architecture, urban plans. Uh, it was just kind of endless. I compiled what I called the manuscript. It was here in my wardrobe, uh, much to the disdain of my wife uh, for many months. And I thought, you know, this is so exciting. In 2015, I thought in a year or two, this is going to be done. It's going to be a book. And then this happened. Um, my wife and I were expecting uh, our first child. This is my wife, Tina Nandi. And we decided two things uh, when, when we became pregnant. One, we wanted a home birth. 
okay? Now in Mumbai, that's not like the most common thing, but we wanted a home birth. And the second thing we decided is we want a water birth, which is what it sounds like, right? A water birth at home. Um, so May 18, 2016, Tina goes into labor, uh, early in the morning, around 8, 9 a.m. Things are progressing smoothly through the day, and at 2 p.m., there's a knock on the door. Okay, do we have any Hindi speakers with us this morning? I'm just curious. No, I, okay, I'm gonna start in, oh, in the back, okay, thank you. So I'm gonna say for you, and then everyone else will translate in English. So get a knock on the door, 2 p.m. 8 a.m., Tina had gone into labor. I open the door, it's our security guard, okay? And this is completely true. It says, Saab, aaj panch baje se kal subay saat baje kuch bhi paani nahi milega. From today, 5 o'clock till tomorrow at 7 a.m., there will be no water. No water in the taps. 100% water cut. And I get serious. When you cut water in Bombay, like they cut it. It's fully gone. I panicked. It was 2 p.m. at the time. Had three hours. Uh, I didn't tell Tina because she would have like, gotten totally distracted. I started quickly just filling. We had three hours filling, filling. Fortunately, uh, surprised myself and her, uh, managed. Uh, we filled up our kiddie pool, and uh, late that evening, just before midnight, our son was born. So, thank you. Some <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I presume that's for Tina, because I didn't really do anything except fill water. So, you know, of course, our son kind of slowed down the book like anything, um, but that's okay, because what began is this kind of very serious, scholarly, uh, research project after the water birth and after, you know, having him in our lives for a few years, it kind of transformed it into this very playful and artistic imagination. And then I would like to think these two things are combined and you see a little bit of that this morning. Naturally, the first question I asked after the birth, what was the first plan for the city's water supply, right? Like why in 2020 are we still struggling to get water in our taps? 2016. So this was one of the first plans, 1852. Uh, it was a very kind of simple, elegant idea within all the tanks and wells across the city, an island city, uh, to sink filtering wells, right? Wells to just cleanse water so people could draw for their daily use. Uh, it was prepared by a hydraulic engineer, Henry Conybeare. I, I love his, uh, his signature, very elegant. Um, this was his imagination. Of course, it failed. Mega reservoirs became the future of the city's water supply. Um, and Henry Conybeare was an interesting man. He was, of course, an engineer, but he, like Arthur Crawford, he kind of thought about the whole city. And he looked upon this area that we know as Back Bay, and he said there are a couple of things wrong here. One, we shouldn't have cremations on the sands overlooking the water, right? This should be a scenic spot in the city's uh, space. Second thing, this uh, burial ground, he said the burial ground should be moved from here and placed on the hillside that you see in the background. Now that's Malabar Hill, uh, it's a very, it has the most expensive real estate in uh, Bombay today and in much of the world. Uh, so he said that's where bodies should be buried because there's no way anyone could build buildings on that slope. Of course, completely wrong. Um, and then he said once we cleanse the sands, we should create a marine parade, okay? And that was a really historic moment because Bombay's most kind of enigmatic, uh, photogenic urban gesture is Marine Drive. Uh, it was created about five decades after this imagination of a marine parade connecting people on the sands uh, with uh, the water. This is the Marine Drive today. Uh, Again, very popular spot. Uh, and if we kind of backtrack four centuries, this is what the island city looked like, right? We have a very bizarre relationship with water. Much of the city used to be underwater in this kind of this uh, separate, seven separate islands. Over time, uh, these kind of gaps were filled with dams and then land was infilled. Now, the problem is, we yet, the center of the city is still below sea level. So in effect, it's like a giant bathtub, right? That's basically, Bombay's like a giant bathtub. And there are two reasons that's problematic. One, we have the monsoons, seasonal monsoons, which we're just escaping out of at the moment. The second problem is it's a city by the sea. So when you have high tide colliding with the monsoons, this is what happens. Every year, if you watch the news, BBC something, you'll see Bombay just underwater. Uh, it's almost inevitable with our geographic condition. In 1720, a gentleman by the name of Captain Johnson thought of a, the, the, he called the Great Channel, 
Okay, his proposal is to cut a channel across the island. And this is what we call a speculation, right? There was a very dense written literary history of the idea, but no visual survived. So we created visuals for many of these ideas. They combined what I call the rigor of the historian with the wild creativity of the artist. Uh, this was the seminal sketch for the great channel. And this is what uh, I like to think Johnson's uh, intervention would have looked like. It was to allow the sea to cross through uh, the island, to allow the monsoon rains to kind of funnel, uh, and thereby prevent the city from being flooded, as happens every year right now. This, uh, this space at the bottom, this is a mausoleum. It's a burial, burial space. Uh, it's called Haji Ali, which is located today here in the island city. Yeah, the great channel was to cut uh, in this position, and I like to think, had this been successful, Bombay might have ended up looking something like this, right? A series of channels cut across for flood intervention, um, and it would have been like Venice, like an oriental Venice. And this is interesting because in 1900, Jamsheji Tata had an idea for what he called oriental Venice, and it was to be in the suburban area, uh, known as from Kar to Juhu, in this space. And he imagined this is 500 one-acre plots, all connected by canals, right? Um, this is Juhu today. Again, you see the monsoon kind of overwhelming the city. Uh, of course, this did not happen. The land was completely filled up. Uh, but this would have been Bombay's first and only residential development without a single road. Uh, it was quite brilliant. Now, this idea, connecting people with water, uh, it's been kind of a constant theme in the city's history and urban growth. Of course, many of you may know of uh, Mr. Charles Correa. Um, he had this plan in 1974 called the Back Bay Waterfront, um, and that was located in the southern part of the island. So we're going to kind of zoom in here and focus on Back Bay for a bit. This is Back Bay in the 1600s. Uh, it's almost nothing, basically. And in 1863, the first urban plan, urban intervention, was the Back Bay Reclamation. And it was basically this, a giant private enterprise. Everything you see in green was new reclamation, new landfill um, for the purpose of commercial profit. It was about 1,500 acres. This plan collapsed when the American Civil War ended because Bombay's economy at the time was linked to cotton and uh, everything kind of uh, collapsed at that point. Six decades later, the plan comes back, uh, this time known as the Back Bay Reclamation Scheme. And what you see in red is the profile of the physical form of the city at that time. Yellow was the aspiration. That's what they were trying to, to create. And the idea was simple. From the bottom of the harbor, which you see in brown, uh, they were to pick up mud from the bottom, ship it across uh, Kolaba, what's known as Kolaba, and dump it on this rocky foreshore behind a retaining wall, which you see in solid yellow was to be a retaining wall. Um, now, there was one problem. That retaining wall didn't retain. It leaked like a tap. And all the mud just kind of seeped back into the bay. It was this Sisyphean task of, uh, of failed uh, aspirations. Uh, it completely, completely, of course, fell apart. And in 1927, an, uh, a resident said this, we are now condemned to gaze at something which, to put in homely language, looks like nothing on earth. I love that quote because it's still the case today. This is uh, an image from about five years ago. Uh, it looks absolutely to me like nothing on earth. Uh, what you see, that leaky retaining wall is still floating kind of aimlessly in Back Bay, uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's, I consider it all like a graveyard of past ideas. Now we'll come to Mr. Correa's plan. Again, this is 1974. You see the leaky retaining wall at the top left. And what Korea says is, let's not reclaim fully, let's just sculpt the edge. Make the edge of this incomplete reclamation a little bit poetic, like a poetic promenade. Uh, let's put public facilities, art galleries, institutions, a planetarium uh, around this public edge uh, and just make it a beautiful space for citizens of the city. Um, he called it an event for the city, a new and unique waterfront unprecedented in the contemporary Indian urban scene. Uh, really lovely ideas. This was one of the visualizations he created. Um, in the left, far left, you see the bay itself. Um, but what I find interesting is there are a few skyscrapers, right, in this uh, visualization. Uh, this is, in, again, in the 70s. Around this time, there's this 
proliferation of uh, vertical growth. The skyscrapers would have been located here. You can see that incomplete retaining wall kind of floating in this drawing as well. Um, this is important in, in a kind of interesting space in the city because in the 50s, Le Corbusier wanted to build in Bombay, right? This is where he imagined uh, the Air India Tower. And this is what Correa recounted of Corbusier's vision. Can you imagine what would have happened if Corbusier had built this building at the end of Marine Drive? It would have been an architectural gesture that would have changed our lives. I love that. 10 or 20 other people driving down Marine Drive would have been inspired to create a building like that. It would have changed our city. Right? I love this. And Correa recounts this idea over decades to different journalists. Really, really lovely. Um, of course, a mediocre building came up in its place. Um, this was another vision for a skyscraper in the 60s, 102 stories high by Feroz Kudianwala. And then, of course, in early 2000s, uh, there was a competition for a tower at the end of, other end of Marine Drive. This was Oma's entry. Uh, it was basically a pie in the sky, like literally a pie stacked up. Um, and then the same plot, the winning entry for that competition was this 700-meter tower by Foster and Partners. Um, uh, it would have, I think, tickled the troposphere, if I understand correctly. Um, and if you see at the bottom of this image, those little, little trees in scale, that's actually a site of a burial ground. And it's the same burial ground that Connie Bear wanted to shift to Malabar Hill uh, about a century and a half later. So it's very interesting, these ideas of below ground and above ground imaginations. So we're still connecting people and water, but that's a problem because the sea near Mumbai is among the most polluted in the world, right? That's really unfortunate. Uh, this is an article from 2017. Now, you may think this is a new problem. It's not 1855. A resident, James McLean, says this. All around the island of Bombay was one foul cesspool, sewers discharging on the sand, sewers whose gaping mouths discharge deep black streams across your path. Right? That sounds really bad, and it is, uh, because these are images from the last few years. Uh, this is a really deep black stream uh, in a suburban area, as is this one at Malad. Uh, this is all, unfortunately, basically raw sewage, kind of just discharging into the sea. 1866, uh, an city-based engineer, Russell Lakin, comes up with a plan for the greatest sewer uh, to solve this problem. And he styled it on the Cloca Maxima in Rome, also, of course, the greatest sewer. Uh, this was one of his section drawings. Uh, this is the city's profile. You see that beautiful bathtub effect in section, the center's lowest. Underground, of course, was to be this 10-foot diameter sewer. And then from its destination, the sewage was to be kind of chucked into the ocean, uh, deep to sea, also problematic, uh, but of course didn't happen. A few years later, a gentleman by the name of Hector Tula comes up with plans for an underground railway. Now you may think, like, what does a railway have to do with sanitation? Uh, it's really beautiful, just uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, this was the, the route of his underground railway, is from a place called Jacob Circle to the business district. You also see Crawford's green blob in this plan. They were kind of uh, contemporaries overlapping in their ideas. This was his description. During the day, passengers were to be ferried southwards into the city center, while at night, northbound carriages filled with the day's business, fecal matter, were to traverse the same tracks. Wow. Right? It was a poop train, basically. Like, that was it. Uh, I love it. Um, now, of course, like every city, we name our railway lines, no? I travel every day on the Western Line, carries about 7 million people per day. Um, the Central Line runs parallel, and then the Harbor Line, these are kind of the, the backbone of the city. Uh, under construction right now is this uh, called the Dream Line. It's partly underground. We've recently completed the Red Line in the suburbs. Now, I like to think Hector Tulek's train would have been called the Brown Line right? Naturally. Uh, and it would have had this really beautiful streak of a logo. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ooh, Hector Tulik. Yes. I bet he never thought a crowd in Turin would be cl clapping for his, uh, his poop train. So this was, this was the route of his train uh, from the fort to Jacob Circle, and then from Jacob Circle up to the suburbs. And that red blob you see at the top, that's where he was to throw all the sewage uh, onto this kind of low-lying marshland for the purpose of sewage irrigation um, and, and reducing vegetable prices in the city. Really brilliant. Uh, th this is what he said. 
The present project is for utilizing the sewage proper and not for throwing it into the sea, right? So he's sensitive to this idea that the sea has life. We need to be, uh, you know, gentle in how we tread. A few decades later, NV Moda comes with a similar plan, Love Grove Sewage Scheme. Um, and this was really uh, a fascinating plan. It had one ambition, one simple ambition, to eradicate the nuisance caused by the discharge of crude sewage into the sea at Worley. Yeah? And this was, this was a layout of his plan. He created it after visiting 76 cities on four continents. Okay, and he's just visiting sanitation plants, sewage treatment plants. He comes back to Bombay, creates this elaborate idea of primary, secondary, tertiary treatment, then water can be responsibly discharged into the sea. Of course, everyone said land's too valuable in Bombay, nothing going, and the World Bank stepped in and helped support this, uh, an outfall, underwater, undersea outfall, um, basically after uh, preliminary screening, not much more, uh, and that's part of a strong part of the reason our waters are just so polluted today. Now, this is problematic for architects, of course, because in the 60s, uh, a very kind of uh, established firm, I am Kadri, comes up with these beautiful drawings for the Bombay Hilton Hotel, right? And what do you see that's consistent in all these? It's the ocean, it's the sea, right? The hotels to overlook the scenic vista, um, you know, of, of the, the skyline. Unfortunately, Hilton's dreams soon turned into a nightmare when visiting foreign executives discovered a dirty little secret. The waters at Worley were flush with raw sewage, right? So they had these visions that guests would just be collapsing by the pool because of the, the noxious fumes. And of course, the project completely died and wasn't, wasn't realized. Let's shift. This is William Walker. Um, I really, really like him. Bombay Imagined is dedicated to him. He was in the city from 1845 to 1865. Um, and he had a lot of really, really crazy ideas. Uh, my favorite is what he called luminous cremation, okay? A really, really beautiful uh, imagination. And I'm going to read, this is his quote, uh, just hang with it, it's a long quote, hang with it. Would it not create a sweetly mournful feeling in our breasts to see that, although our friend be dead, yet meteor-like as in life, he was shedding an effulgent ray to dispel the darkness before seeking the flowing galaxy of light in the other world. It's so beautiful, so much poetry. His basic plan was this, that a body's being cremated. Let's capture the gas from that cremation. Let's pipe it throughout the city and light all the street lamps on the city's walkways with this gas, right? So our friend is now in darkness, but he's yet giving light to us in this world. Very beautiful. Um, bear with me for a minute. I asked myself, why did he want to light the streets? Like, why? Why go through all this effort? Then it, after weeks of meditation, it became obvious because he was a walker, right? Yes. <laughs> Whew, walkers. Okay. <laughs> no one's ever clapped for these jokes. Thank you. <laughs> or maybe it's for William Walker. I don't know. Uh, so in 1863, he's recycling the dead. Yeah. Uh, two years later, Bombay has what I think was maybe the first public transportation system for the deceased anywhere in the world. Um, really, really, again, beautiful idea. It was to be a whole city of the dead. 250-acre, brand-new city was to be created at this area known as Matunga. Uh, it was to have, of course, Christian Catholic cemeteries, Muslim burial grounds, a Parsi tower of silence where vultures just kind of picket bodies and, and naturally disperse, and, of course, uh, cremation gods. Um, and we have to name... And, and to connect that city, which was in the north, with the residents in the south, of course, there was to be a railway line. So... We have to name our lines. We already know about the core ones, the dream line, the red line. The brown line is hopefully up and coming. And this would have been, I think, the deadline, right? Uh, and it would have been like the ultimate deadline. You cannot miss this train. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> transportation. Let's continue with transportation. This time, let's focus on for the living. Yeah? 1870s, Arthur Crawford. Remember, he's that green blob man from the earlier park on the landfill, Arthur Crawford says the city needs a coastal road. And that coastal road was, is what it sounds like. It was to wrap around uh, the city's coast, and it was to include a tunnel through Malabar Hill, one of the bathtub rims. Cut a tunnel right through one of those rims. Um, this is what I think uh, the tunnel would have looked like. 
And this is what one of the visualizers that worked with us, Ani Ketumaria, made. It's a really beautiful image. In the distance, you see the reclamation uh, created for the coastal road. So this was to keep you know, roads and a lot of high-speed transportation on the periphery of the city. By 1945, there's this idea of cutting a grid straight through the heart of the island. Um, you see it here, and this was the section of that grid. It was to cater to every walk and, and form of life and movement. Um, that didn't happen, of course. It's just chaos again still today. And in 1973, uh, a gentleman who was actually the resident editor of Times of India, he got fed up. He said, we shouldn't focus on the coast. We shouldn't cut you know, these streets through the heart of the city. Simple solution, ban all private vehicles. Simple. Uh, and he said, everyone should travel by public transport. And this was a real schema. Huh? He wasn't just like, uh, yeah. Everyone should travel by public transport and then the streets, the part of streets that are not being used for these bus lanes should then become public parks. Uh, so really, really, really lovely transformation, I, I think he imagined. Um, it fell apart. He said, of course, politicians won't rub shoulders with mere pedestrians, and uh, it, it remained but a pipe dream. But the idea, of course, continues. Uh, this is a plan from 2012 uh, by a city-based firm, AJA Architects, and they took this area outside Ma Lakshmi Station and said this should become just a pedestrian bridge. So after you travel with those seven million commuters, you step out of the station, there should be a beautiful public space, public open space to welcome you as you walk to work. Um, that park was to actually end at a place called Jacob Circle, which you see here. Uh, also the end of the Brown Line. If you recall the Brown Line, it was to end here. Um, a lot of interesting, interesting ideas in that realm. And then in the 1920s, another resident said, you know, forget all of that, we should take all the transportation to the sky. Uh, everyone should travel by aerial taxis, uh, which of course you see. Um, and this was, this was a plan in 1921 for the city in 1971. And again, it is, I, I love, love this idea. This is how the creator described it. He says this, I had fallen off the seat on which I had gone to sleep on Malabar Point and had rolled down the slope. Only the railings had stopped me from falling into the sea. I staggered to my feet and looked wildly around. Yes, I had been dreaming. Right? The poor man fell asleep, had a dream, rolled down the hill and woke up. And his dream was this, that Bombay is not a place of crazy traffic. All the taxis are in the sky. And... Uh-oh. Yeah. And then in the background, it's just a public park. It's a lot of green. And I love this, this dream because it, in many ways, I think kind of the dream of every Bombay resident is to go back to an environment that looked like the city as it, as it initially was. Um, this was Bombay in 1670. Uh, this is when the governor, uh, East India Company governor, came to the city. He came with a map of London, which was given to him uh, by his superiors, and he was told, create a city at Bombay on these seven islands, kind of cut by the ocean at high tide. He walks into the Bombay castle, which was existing, and he looks at the map. He does some kind of research around the island, and he comes back and says, I cannot create Bombay, at least not right now. Um, and the reason was it would have required cutting of palm trees. And he said the local population, they love their palm trees so much, and they rely on them, uh, that there will be riots, that we will have a war on our hands if we try to create Bombay right now. So the very first um, kind of imagination for the city, the city itself, failed because of that. Uh, this, I, I love this image. This is the city as it initially would have looked, its kind of initial ecology. Now, I think I like to think of books like cities. Uh, they work best when you have a lot of diverse people just kind of collaborating with passion and intensity. So I, I always introduce the team, part of the team uh, behind the book. Uh, this is Aniket Umaria. Uh, he's a visualizer based in Bombay. That image 1670, the kind of primordial Bombay, that's one of his many pieces in the book. Deshna Mehta and Carol Nair were the book designers. Uh, and they did absolutely fabulous things with graphics uh, and visuals. And then Fawaz Khan, he was the project manager. Uh, the book exists today because of his efforts and, and very intense uh, focus. This is part of the team behind the printing and binding of the book. Uh, they're absolute 
Um, I consider them artisanal bookmakers. Every inch of the book was handcrafted. Uh, so I'm really, really grateful to them. All 62,000 words in Bombay Imagine were first handwritten uh, in the morning between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. before I would, would rush to office. Um, I love handwriting, and that's really interesting because W.H. Alden said, most people enjoy the sight of their own handwriting as they enjoy the smell of their own farts, right? And I think, I think that's absolutely true. Um, whew, farts. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, I have to acknowledge Bonnie Stevens, our cat. She went over every word in the book, always there. Um, only complaint, she's a copycat. So, yeah. Uh, and she's, but she's been on top of the books from the beginning, so thanks, Bonnie. Uh, of course, my wife, who you met from the home birth, water birth, uh, she's been super supportive. We self-published. She allowed us basically to take this like really huge financial risk. Um, uh, so thanks, thanks, Tina. And then, of course, Kaidov, he's actually in the audience, so if anyone wants to meet him, he's really sweet, um, and he would love to meet you. Woo, Kairov. <laughs> he, um, he, he's allowed us to encroach upon his play space in our living room, so if you see him, do thank him uh, on my behalf. Uh, we would really appreciate that. So uh, that's Bombay Imagine. Thank you all very much uh, for listening. Thank you. I, I don't say it uh, always, but it's my <laughs> one of my favorite talk since the beginning of the festival. And I agree. Of, and Definitely of course, you. Uh, you are a very professional public speaker, so you lied at the beginning <laughs> about not doing this uh, 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 often. The power of imagination. Do you think that a city like Turin would need uh, this sort of uh, maniac and precise uh, mm. collection of all the un- finished, undone uh, project? I think every city, when you start digging, you realize every city is full of dreamers. And I think compiling something that spans the, the, the urban life of the city into one volume, it creates, this is what has surprised me about the book, it creates something that inspires not just architects, urban planners, but every resident gets inspired by something. So, yes. Wow, yeah. so that's Thank the you. Grazie. Thank you. That's Thank the you. that's the basic of Utopian Hours. Thank yes. you so much, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.